it is nice to see old friends and it's uh, nice to see new friends it's but nice to see everybody thanks for coming out thanks if you're staring at a monitor for staring at your monitor for a few minutes um it's great to be back in in Asheville. Uh, my wife and son and I moved here in 1993, and I've been here every year. So I've been there for 15 years, and then I get back uh, fairly often. And uh, that's not just interesting to me, but uh, somewhat relevant because I, I moved here uh, to direct the MFA program over at Warren Wilson. And these essays and the essays in Maps of the Imagination and Amuse and Amaze would not exist if it weren't for the uh, program at Warren Wilson. Uh, nowhere else in my teaching practice have I dared to lecture. Uh, I don't know what your experience was in school, but but the uh, students I tend to work with are not clamoring for more lectures. Uh, fair, hardly anybody is asking to be uh, tied to their chair and talked at for an hour or two. Um, but at Warren Wilson, it's a little bit different. Uh, some of you are the program, some of you know the program well, uh, but in case you don't uh, know it, uh, it's a low residency program, which means the students come from all over the country, some from outside of the country, uh, for 10 days at the start of each semester. And for as long as the program has uh, been around, everybody has gone to everything. Uh, so the faculty all go to the lectures and classes, and it doesn't matter whether you're a poet or a fiction writer, you go to the various lectures and classes and everything, um, which is a wonderful way to learn to teach because you get to see everybody at work. My wife and I talk about this quite a lot, but she's in education. And uh, often, you know, you get whatever training you get in education and you're put in a classroom and you're essentially in a silo. I mean, unless you have nice colleagues and you trade ideas with them, you don't really know how other people go about it. But at Warren Wilson, there's no shortage of opportunities for that. And in fact, sometimes the opportunities are kind of daunting because uh, now over whatever it's been 30 years, you know, I've had the opportunity to lecture to audiences that have included people like Andrew Barrett and Richard Russo and Charles Baxter and Heather McHugh and Ellen Brian Boyd, which if you thought about it, you would never be able to do, right? I mean, you would not dare to stand up and and lecture to those people. So you have to tell yourself you're lecturing to students and they also happen to be in chairs in the room. Uh, two other great things about it. One is um, there's just from the outset, uh, there was sort of the notion that everyone would lecture about things they particularly cared about that were relevant to their practice and that you would never repeat yourself. So you can't, you know, I confess occasionally in an undergraduate intro to fiction undergraduate class, you know, I will open the safe, and, you know, pull open the door and dust off, you know, my introduction to character talk or whatever, because, you know, one has to save a little time. Uh, but that is not the way things uh, work at Warren Wilson. And so I've had plenty of opportunity to to think about uh, all sorts of aspects of fiction and to uh, write about them, thanks to the program. These three books, I'll talk about the other two just briefly, in part because they're here, in part because somebody just got a uh, copy of Maps of the Imagination here a couple of weeks ago and was so excited about it that they wrote a letter to the publisher, which my publisher was so excited about, that they took a photo of it and sent it to me and said, this is the best letter I've ever gotten from somebody. And I thought, that was nice. Thanks to Malaprops for uh, doing that. Uh, Maps of the Imagination is kind of an odd uh, book. I mean, I'm fond of it, but uh, it's kind of an odd book because it really started from the idea of uh, the question, in what way is a story or a novel or any piece of writing like a map? And that question was inspired by uh, the work of a North Carolinian, a guy named Dennis Woods, who wrote the book, a book called The Power of Maps. And uh, he was interested in how to read maps critically. And as I read that, I thought, well, virtually everything he said here applies to writing. And so I sort of unraveled what he was saying about maps and thought about it in terms of stories and novels. And so, you know, there are essays in there about, I don't know, how do you, how do you choose what to include and how important is it to decide what to exclude, which is critical to a map. You know, if you're looking at a weather map, you don't want to see streets necessarily. You need to see parts of the country. Um, and the, so those essays all unfold from that basic idea. There's a central metaphor to it. It also happens to be a beautiful book. Uh, it, was, it was designed by a guy named DJ Stout, who won all sorts of awards for it. And, uh, and because of that, it appealed to people beyond writers. It appealed to artists and designers and map makers, unfortunately. Got me into trouble. Um, and uh, other folks. And it got me not only the usual sorts of speaking gigs, talking to writers, uh, but things like talking to the marketing team at General Mills, which you know, I still can't quite explain, but it was fun. Um, 
And then uh, Amuse and Amaze unfolded a little bit differently. I was working on uh, disparate essays and then I was trying to think about their common quality. And I realized that to some extent they were all about the arrangement of information. And I confess one of my guilty pleasures was doing puzzles. And I know some other writers who uh, do quite a lot of puzzles or some who create puzzles. And I was trying to think about how those things are related. And although, you know, a story or a poem is not something to solve, it's not something to answer necessarily, still you're arranging information to lead somebody to think in a certain way about certain things and focusing their attention in particular ways. And so that's what those essays are about. Um, the, the full title is Amuse and Amaze, Writing is Puzzle, Mystery, and Magic. And I wanted to acknowledge the muse part. I wanted to acknowledge the fact that there are things we can teach about writing and things we can learn about writing, but there are plenty of things we can't. Uh, it's just things that are part of an individual's vision or th things that happen through intuition or, you know, people, some people refer to it as the muse. And also I was interested in magic because uh, people talk about some of the books they love as feeling magical in some way. And, you know, I had the same kind of interest in magic that a lot of young boys did. And uh, I was kind of charmed by that. I don't know about you, but but I had the experience often when I bought some magic kit. I don't know if I'm talking to anybody else in the audience but myself right now. Um, but, but, you know, and you find out why the little guillotine could chop the cigarette in half, but it didn't chop your finger in half. And you found out and you're like, eh. you know, I mean, it wasn't very exciting. But, but in addition to the normal writing gigs that I got at Amuse and Amaze, I was invited to speak to an international conference of magicians at uh, the Magic Castle in Hollywood which is the private club for magicians in the United States, which was terrifying uh, since I know nothing about magic uh, in particular. But it meant that I got to watch uh, Joshua Jay, who was the host of that conference. Uh, Joshua Jay uh, not only demonstrate uh, tricks, which they all did at different times, but also do what they say magicians never do, which is to explain how they worked. And here's what I can tell you. For real magicians, I mean, the guys who are and women who are really good, you can know exactly how they're doing what they're doing and you can watch it again and it's still amazing. Uh, it's, uh, I heard an explanation of a difficult card trick that Josh uh, does as part of his act and he showed it to us three times and I still could not imagine keeping in mind all the things he keeps in mind while he's doing that trick. Teller uh, of Penn and Teller says that uh, one of the reasons so many people don't uh, can't imagine how a magic trick is done is because they wouldn't believe anybody would spend that much time figuring out the thing they have to do to make it happen. He says they spend years on a particular illusion. Anyway, so uh, that was a different kind of book as well. And for this book, this really grew out of conversations with students. It grew out of kind of odds and ends of either questions that came up or thorny issues that didn't seem to be easily resolved, uh, things that I hadn't addressed in the other books, but, but still seemed kind of interesting and worth pursuing. And uh, since I spent a lot of my time talking to writers, uh, undergraduates, uh, MFA students, PhD students, and sometimes just independent writers who get in touch with me, um, since I spend a lot of time talking about these things, it helps for me to kind of formalize them. And it's also easier to sometimes put something in writing and explain it in detail than to continually do it in conversation. So that's where eight of these essays came from. And then uh, two of the essays actually came in a different way from Warren Wilson. Uh, I wanted to offer a larger audience a couple of the teaching tools uh, that we've developed and refined over decades uh, in that program. And uh, one of those is just the way we approach the uh, workshops. And you, it does, you don't have to be in an academic program to have a, a group discussion uh, like this. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. And then there's this uh, thing we use called annotations, which are close reading of the writing that you admire and how to learn lessons from that. And I realized at some point while we were you know, working on those things, uh, that those are tools that anybody could use. You wouldn't have to be in a graduate program. And I thought it would be helpful to have those resources kind of out in the world in a different way. And there are things I've adapted to different audiences uh, in my other teaching. Anyway, uh, the title, uh, don't stop me if you've heard this before, as I was telling a group over at UNCA this afternoon, uh, is unfortunately kind of a joke that came back and got me. Um, I had this manuscript together and I sent it off to my uh, publisher, Trinity University Press, who were very good to me. And uh, I thought I have no business writing a third book about writing.
writing, you know, this is, I kind of was hiding my head, but I sent it off to him. And I said, Sami, if you've heard this before, that was kind of my introduction to the fact that I sent him this manuscript. And then I thought, but no, I really want him to publish it. So I said, don't, you know, stop me if you've heard this before. And I didn't hear anything from them for the longest time. And I thought it had gotten lost or maybe they just weren't interested. And so I wrote and asked if they got it. And they said, oh, sure, we, we want to publish it. And they sent me a contract and this was the title. <laughs> don't stop me if you've heard this before and i said well that's not really the title and he said oh it's a great title <laughs> so, so here we are <laughs> i guess it works um it, it is the title of one of the essays and the essay originally started uh, uh because i became fascinated with stories in which uh, people uh, keep telling the same story in which a character keeps telling the same story. And that's a phenomenon you know from life where people get hung up on a certain either story they think is flattering to themselves and so they retell it and you know maybe that's not so good. Uh, but sometimes a story that really puzzles them or they think explains something about their family. And so they'll say, well, you know why that is? She, and they tell the story that I think explains somebody's behavior. And so there are these kind of crucial stories, you know, to our understanding of ourselves, our understandings of our families. Sometimes they're communal stories, you know, the stories we tell about the group of people we grew up with, something like that. And it's fun, of course, because you get to a party or maybe Thanksgiving or something else, people will start to fill in pieces of those stories. People contradict each other, you know, people start talking louder and louder. And I was interested in how that kind of storytelling could show up in fiction. And uh, so I was searching for examples and I came across uh, or I went back to Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon, which is a novel I knew pretty well, but I had never thought about it in that way. And the more closely I looked at it, the more I realized that she has characters tell stories in all sorts of ways. Characters who pursue stories, who try to find out the truth behind different stories, uh, stories that are assembled over the course of the novel. Anyway, it was a fascinating example. So all of these, this is related, all of the, oh, I forgot to tell you about the magic castle. Oh, well. Um, all these essays have uh, kind of illustrative anecdotes uh, because, as I said, people usually aren't dying to sit through a lecture. And I'm not sure people are absolutely desperate to read a book of essays, uh, but I wanted to tell stories from life that illustrated the various uh, topics that I wanted to write about in fiction because these are not things that only occur in fiction. They're interesting in fiction because they come from life. Uh, and so I'm gonna read um, from two of these, I think. I'm going to read this, uh, the beginning of this, don't stop me if you've heard this before. Uh, and I'm going to read it for my sister. Uh, it's her birthday today, so I'm there. Um, and I can guarantee you two things. It's going to make her cry. <laughs> and she will correct me as soon as I talk to her next about whatever I've gotten wrong here. Um, but that's the way these stories work, right? That family story. You tell your version of it and say, no, 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 that's not how it was. Wrong. She wasn't that mad. All right, so this is the beginning of uh, Don't Stop Me if you've heard this before. Like a lot of writers, I discovered a love of reading early in life. That was thanks to my mother primarily, as she read to my sister and me every night when we were young. Pretty common for writers to get that stuck. Once I started reading on my own, she fed my habit with books she bought at the grocery store, the Hardy Boys mainly, and took us to the Baltimore County Public Library where I would check out stacks of books I could barely see over as I carried them to the car. My mother's only regular opportunity to read came once a week while she sat under the dryer at the beauty shop. For a while when I attended college and then graduate school, opportunities she never had, she read books I recommended. As her tastes grew further apart, she would buy me books she knew I wanted, but that she would never read. I wish I had been as generous and spent more time talking with her about the books she enjoyed, books by Baltimore writers or about growing up Catholic that for one reason or another were an eye on my list. She continued buying me books long after I could afford all the ones I wanted, dating and inscribing them. To this day, I'm surprised when I go to my shelves and see her handwriting in, say, Larry McMurtry's Some Can Whistle, or Gabriel Garcia Marquez's The General in His Labyrinth. Surprised and grateful, reminded of how she supported me on a journey she wanted me going on. Depending on his mood, our father was either mystified or exasperated by all my reading. TV shows he understood, ditto movies on TV, especially war stories and westerns. Movies and theaters, unnecessary extravagance. Cops and robbers, heroes and villains. Perry Mason and John Wayne. McHale's Navy and Gomer Pyle. Books, suspicious. Our father was a storyteller though. Like a lot of storytellers, he tended to dramatize, to mythologize, whether he was recounting a golf game, 
reminding us how, even though he had no relevant experience, he got a job as a barber when he joined the Marines. I suffered for that for many years. Uh, telling about the day with our mother uh, navigating that they nearly drove onto an active runway at Friendship Airport. Or polishing tales of his youth, like the one about the time he and his friends broke into a railroad freight car, ate the watermelons they found inside, got caught, and were taken to their parents, who made them eat the rest of the watermelons until they were sick. Despite some questionable claims in those stories, we never questioned them. Our father could be hot-tempered, but when he told stories, he was in good humor. We laughed and laughed. Like pool players at a jukebox, we would call up our favorites. My sister especially liked that watermelon story to the point that she could tell it herself. In our family, like most families, there were talkers and there were listeners. My father and sister were talkers, gregarious, never hesitant to strike up conversation with strangers, always ready with a story. My mother and me, not so much. But a few weeks before she died, I persuaded our mother to tell us some of the stories we thought we knew. After decades of listening to our father, I wanted to hear her version. Yeah, let's skip a little bit here. In storytelling mode, our father bore some resemblance to Jackie Gleason. I'm really dating myself here. Does anyone else? Somebody might remember Jackie Gleason. Oh, now. Yeah, exactly. Right. There you go. <laughs> a solid working class man, haircut tight to his head, fully assuming his role as head of household, talking loudly, gesturing broadly, giving expression to a wide range of emotions. Our mother played the role of sidekick mostly called on to confirm certain claims, very rarely contradicting or correcting, even more rarely initiating a story herself. Stories had to be drawn from her. I didn't expect her to reveal some shocking new insight about the episode at Friendship Airport, which always had the earmarks of a simple anecdote. They made a wrong turn, panicked. That day in the nursing home, my sister and I asked her to tell stories mostly to keep her mind off her pain, but I had a secondary motive. My son who was there with me was engaged to be married and while we couldn't say it, none of us expected my mother to live to the wedding. So I asked the question I thought she could answer without being overcome by sadness, when I genuinely wanted to hear her answer to me. Exactly how and when had our father proposed? It was 1953, my mother told us. We were in the car in the driveway. He said, you should marry me. <laughs> Always the romantic, I said. And I said, I don't think so. News to me. You told him no? Three other boys had already asked me that year, she said, and I had told them yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've you all got stories like that, right? But, uh, but too often when we write uh, fiction, at least when some of the writers I know write fiction, we worry that dialogue should be short and pithy. Who said pithy? Uh, but, but that should be uh, short and that if characters talk too long, it would be boring. But people tell stories, and uh, stories are important to people. And so to think about how characters tell them, when they get interrupted, who, who gets to speak and who doesn't, how those stories eventually come out, uh, can be important to a tale. So like I said, Toni Morrison's novel serves as the basis of most of that one. I'll read to you from one other of these, and we'll see where we stand at the time. Um, one of these essays is called Don't Stand So Close to Me, and it's got nothing to do with the police uh, or that song. It's just a handy title. But here's kind of a strange phenomenon that I was noticing in some of the stories that I was given to read. Um, when the stories were in first person, when it seemed as if the character were telling the story, often there seemed to be no question about whether we should not necessarily believe the character, but whether we should interpret everything the character said the way the character did. Uh, and I'm seeing that so often that I realized it was hard to tell if the writer who could write that story well, and a lot of people uh, can write a story in first person uh, that's kind of clever and amusing well. I mean, that's kind of how you begin to be a writer because you can tell a story. Um, but then the question was, could they tell a story differently? Could they tell a story in the third person? Could they tell a story with a different kind of narrator? And it wasn't always obvious. Um, and so I was urging uh, students to create uh, what we call narrative distance in first person stories to think about how, you know, in life, when people tell stories, we think about how they tell them. We don't just accept everything they say. I mean, if you ask somebody here at the store, you know, where to find my book and they point you to it, you probably don't give it a moment's thought. If they, you know, point you to it and you walk over and it's not there, you're probably mildly miffed and wonder if they're a new employer. Or is it possible that the book is sold out? We can only hope. Um, or if they say, you know, that's a really interesting book. I got to read it last week. And if you're really interested in that sort of thing, we have Peter Warner's new book too, which is 
similar, and you might want to look at that as well. And you say, hey, this is somebody who works in a great bookstore. This is somebody who's been reading what comes in and is aware of somebody's interests. Anyway, here's the beginning of Don't Stand So Close to Me. It's two anecdotes. They're related. Uncle Mac and Aunt Vera had done well, my wife's family felt. They had left small town Iowa and gotten themselves a nice place in Florida on the water in a boat. They were members of a musical society. They drank martinis and they owned a bowling alley back in Burlington, Iowa. Mac died before I joined the family, but now Vera was gone and everyone wanted to know, among other things, what would happen to her famous collection of miniature pictures. I don't remember what month the funeral was held. I remember it was outside and it was uncomfortable, but of course funerals are always uncomfortable. We were all dressed formally and doing our best to look appropriately mournful as members of the family even though my wife and her brother and sister hadn't seen Mac and Vera all that often, and we spouses barely knew anything about them. Before the service started, there was some bad feeling about the fact that remarks would be made, not by a member of the family, but by Paul, the manager of the bowling alley. When he spoke, though, we learned that Paul had a moving story to tell. Mac had hired him when he was a young man and gradually took him under his wing. Mac had been a quite successful businessman twice, once before the Great Depression, when he lost nearly everything, and again after, when having learned his lesson, he conducted all of his business in cash, never taking a loan, never using a credit card. He and Vera had no children, and Paul became their project. Over time, he was promoted and treated less like an employee than an, adop than an adopted son. For this, Paul told us he was deeply grateful. In addition to running the bowling alley, he, was, he, was, he had helped Vera when Mac died, and more recently, he had been actively involved in arranging for her medical care. So far, so good. Now we understood why Paul had been chosen to give the eulogy. Like many people, Paul was at his best when talking about his own experience. The trouble came that day when he had to turn his attention to others. He understandably felt obliged to recognize various people in attendance. And while he had notes, Paul did, it soon became clear that they consisted solely of a list of names and relationships, cousin, niece, neighbor, fellow martini drinker, member of the musical society, etc. He had not, apparently, thought through what he would say about each person, and I'm afraid the man was not a gifted, spontaneous orator. At first, it was perfectly fine that Cousin Judy was special to Vera, and no one objected to the notion that Vera and Sandy always had a special relationship. But the words seemed to get stuck on his lips. After that, every person he mentioned was either special to Vera, very special, or very, very special. The six of us, my wife and I, her brother and sister, their spouses, were sitting together. And about the 10th time Paul, the bowling alley manager, said someone was special, we made the mistake of exchanging glances. From that moment on, special was the only word we heard. <laughs> but redundancy was only part of the problem. I don't know that Paul had what should probably be called a speech impediment. It may just have been a regional accent. Whatever the cause, he pronounced the word spatial. Ralph was spatial. Marie was very special. It got to the point that we waited for it. When it came, we all mouthed the word together. My lovely and good-hearted wife had tears streaming in her cheeks, but not from the loss of poor Vera. <laughs> My brother-in-law struggled mightily to steady his shoes, but the 23rd spatial had him keeling forward, even as his wife ground her heel into his foot. When the service was finally over, we ran to the black limousine waiting for us. Finally, when we slammed the doors, we could scream with laughter. I only hope that we look delirious from grief. <laughs> I always think of that story when, when uh, you know, on the rare occasion, it doesn't happen so much anymore, but when I teach, it only happens, only the uh, undergraduates will tell you this, the graduates are worried about their careers, uh, but an undergraduate will come up to you after you've given what you think is a particularly good class, and they say, yeah, I said, did you notice and I'm thinking, you know what, about to understand. Did you notice you only adjust your glasses with your right hand? <laughs> this, is, this is why I've made a career <laughs> of teaching, so I could hear things like that. Here's the other half of the anecdote. I met Vera once, a few months before she died. She suffered from dementia and had been brought from Florida to a modest nursing facility in Burlington, a small town she'd been so eager to escape. She didn't have many remaining relatives, and not everyone felt compelled to visit, given the progression of her disease. She believed Mac was still alive, and that they would be returning to their home in Florida any day. My wife and I lived in the western suburbs of Chicago then, and my wife truly is a good person, so one morning we made the three-and-a-half-hour drive to Burlington. That day, Vera didn't understand who my wife was, much less follow Laura's explanation of who I was. 
And after we'd absorbed the few simple decorations in the room and the supposedly cheerful signs straight out of a kindergarten classroom meant to remind Vera of the month and date, there wasn't much to do. A small television showed an automobile race. None of us paid attention, though occasionally Vera seemed to be trying to say something about it. Her statements were either incomplete or without context. Vera had trouble forming sentences, much less stringing them together. At first, we tried to converse, then, defeated, we sat. If you've known someone in the final stages of dementia, you know how sad it is. But, and I know this sounds hard-hearted, after a while, the sadness has time to settle in and give way to something like restlessness, even boredom. Not for her caretakers, of course, but for visitors. Or maybe it's just me. I'll admit it, I started checking the time. After an hour or so of keeping Vera company, we said goodbye, and that we were sure the people at the facility would take good care of her, and we were glad she was comfortable, the sort of nonsense you say when the truth is unspeakable. Vera looked at us as we took her hand, but once again, she couldn't get any words out. It wasn't until we were halfway to the door that she began to speak. I, she said, and again, I, who could walk out on a dying woman attempting to form a sentence? Not us. We waited. Finally, Slowly, Vera said, as clearly as we had spoken to her, I'm losing my mind, you know. Well, that still touches me, although it's a long time ago. But you see the same thing at work in the opposite direction, right? I mean, there's Paul trying to give a sincere talk, and we start to notice things that he doesn't intend, and we get completely derailed. So we're listening to something else. And with Vera's story, we were not really any longer expecting any conversation from her. And then she says something so lucid and heartbreaking that you realize that there's still somebody there and you're communicating in a different way. Both those are related to this notion of a first person narrator and a story and our relationship to them and how it changes. So my examples in that essay start with Huck Finn because Huck Finn sometimes is just completely naive uh, and we're supposed to kind of laugh at him or understand things that he doesn't. And then other times he's meant to be insightful and sincere. And it's an extraordinarily difficult thing to do, to have a character, a narrator, who can appeal to the reader both ways. So that Huck can say something moving, like he can see the lights are on when he's on the raft, he can look up to shore and see the lights are on at night. And he can say the only reason lights would be on this, that anybody would have lights up this late is if somebody were staying up or somebody's sick. And it's just like a sympathetic imagination that you don't expect out of this young boy. And then, you know, other times he's watching the circus and he sees, you know, one of the performers act like a drunk walk the wire. And he said, you would never believe that guy from the audience could do, you know, and he realizes he's falling for, falling for everything. And most famously, there's the line where, where he decides to help uh, Jim when he's about to be captured again. And he says, all right, then I'll go to hell, uh, deciding, saying that he's going to do the wrong thing, believing he's going to do the wrong thing. But we know he's doing the right thing. And of course, Mark Twain trusts us to understand that. It's a very difficult thing to do in fiction. More, another famous example is Humbert Humbert and Lolita, who is a despicable character who nonetheless, despite ourselves, sometimes is funny, sometimes is so smart that we can't quite believe it, uh, sometimes is compelling. It's very unsettling. People argue over that book for good reason, because it's unsettling to have somebody who is so vile and yet at the same time kind of interesting, sometimes amusing. It's, it is as complicated as life often is. I was telling when I talked to the students at UNCA today, almost all of us, I'll say, I'd say all of us, but I don't know, I don't know your families. Uh, but, uh, you know, you've got the relative who you cannot talk to about a certain topic, whatever it is, politics seems on the list. Uh, but you, you cannot talk about that thing. And yet you love this person. But yet you are connected to this person and don't totally disassociate from them. And somebody said, hey, you know, somebody in fiction land, in bad fiction land, might say, how could this person probably, you know, stay in conversation with this person who said that wild thing? I said, well, it's complicated. Facebook is right about that. It's complicated, most of our relationships. So uh, I start with Huck Finn and Holden Caulfield, and then I move to contemporary books. I don't know if you all uh, read Olga Tokorczyk, uh, pretty remarkable uh, writer, but um, her, not her most recent book, but the book before, uh, Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead. It's a cheery title. Uh, <laughs> Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead as a, uh, a similarly uh, uh, challenging narrator, Janina, this woman who seems like an odd duck and is. So that's what that essay is about. Let's see where we are. Let's see if I should. I don't want the visitors at home to miss a uh, ball game or anything. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the beginning of one other one. We'll stop there. And then if you have questions, great. 
Thank you, Dalton. Okay. Uh, this is the beginning of an essay called Power Plays. And a lot of people used to say, I don't know if people still say it, but a lot of people used to teach when I was in school. I was in school um, they used to say that uh, fiction is based on conflict, that there has to be a conflict. And then, you know, even before my time, it was man versus man, man versus nature, man versus woman. What was the other one? It wasn't, it wasn't man versus woman. There's a third one. What is it? Man versus man, man versus nature? Man versus God? Is that it? Seems like it could be. Anyway, but there were these kind of classic conflicts. And then uh, after that, uh, uh, a lot of people said, well, that's a pretty reductive way to think about fiction. It's always about these large conflicts. And I think it is probably. There are plenty of interesting stories that are not about battles, and that kind of uh, standoff. Uh, and yet, uh, nearly all fiction happens when there are shifts, shifts in understanding, shifts in relationships, shifts in somebody's life in some way. And those shifts often involve some kind of imbalance of what I call in this essay power, although as I'll explain in a second, I'm not sure that's exactly the right word for it. Uh, but it's been the dynamics of a group of people change and something new is exposed. And so I wanted to write a little bit about that. And this too is from a real story. When my wife and I lived in Arizona, she played in the community orchestra. She plays in a community orchestra. Uh, many of the people who attended the orchestra concerts were related to one of the musicians in some way, and the rest tended to be older folks. I am in no way a youngster, but as I shuffled past the frail elderly couple seated at the end of my row one night, the sheer contrast made me feel like a teenager. I sat down and, like a teenager, began fiddling with my phone, checking email, sending texts, all the usual. The woman beside me, who might have been in her early 80s, said in a surprisingly strong voice, can you get the score on that? <laughs> sure, I said, smiling like a minor god of technology. Score of what? The woman gave me a look of something like surprise and pity. How could I be so young and virile and yet so ignorant? Marquette Syracuse, she said. I'm pulling for Marquette, but Albert, she gestured toward the man I assume to be her husband, who was absorbed in the concert program, says Syracuse is going to win. I tapped my phone a few times and reported that Syracuse was up by two late in the first half. As I did, I noticed that the woman's left hand, wrinkled and discolored by liver spots, was freshly bandaged and badly bruised. I fell last night, she explained. I got up in the middle of the night and tripped on the carpet or something. I reached out for the dresser that missed and fell on this hand. It hurt something awful. I made a vague sympathetic sound. I was hoping it was bad enough that we couldn't fly tomorrow, she said. We're supposed to go to Rochester, and I do not want to go to Rochester. I told Albert, look, now we can't go. And he was so angry with me. He gets angry. He accused me of falling on purpose. As I was thinking of a way to ask what horror awaited them in Rochester, she continued. He bandaged me up himself. He doesn't like for me to see the doctor. She turned toward me to say that part, and for the first time I noticed a bruise on her cheekbone. It looked older, less vivid than the bruise on her hand. At the same moment, Albert, without looking up from the program, reached over and rested his hand on his wife's knee. But rested isn't quite accurate. He put his hand on her knee and, spreading his thumb and forefinger, applied pressure to either side of her kneecap. I could not pay very much attention to the uh, first half of that concert after that conversation. But you can, uh, you can see the thing that I'm uh, trying to illustrate there, I hope. You know, I mean, there's kind of a, a lighthearted scene when it starts off and I'm feeling all pleased with myself because these folks look like they're going to need help getting out of their chairs. And uh, then it turns out this woman is all over March Madness, which I have not a clue about. And uh, and uh, even even after she shows the bruise, she's still kind of carrying the scene. You know, she's the talkative one. She's directing the conversation, all of that. And then I start to notice these wounds that she has. And there's that weird thing about Albert saying, or her saying that he didn't want her to go to the hospital, which is, you know, very alarming. So immediately being a writer, I, you know, leapt to all these conclusions. There's a whole essay in here about Hemingway and some other things uh, about how this happens in fiction, but just to uh, spare you um, any worry about this poor woman in Arizona, I'll read you the very end of the essay. What actually happened was this. After the man put his hand on her knee, the woman used her good right hand to slap his. Stop it, she said, you were angry. And then that's our Jimmy playing cello. His real instrument is oboe, but he plays cello for fun. The woman went on to say that she didn't like to go to Phoenix Symphony concerts because she couldn't see well, that she didn't live in or go to school at Marquette, but always rooted for the Big East, and that she had met Albert Wynn as a researcher at Bell Labs. He had been her summer intern, and we had a little fling because that's what you did with your interns. 50 years later, I guess I'm stuck with it. 
<laughs> the narrative I had imagined turned out not to be true, but several new possibilities have been revealed. And if my telling of the tale here seems manipulative, let that be a reminder of another power play, the power of the storyteller, always arranging information to suit his own ends. Yeah, that was a pretty delightful. I'm so pleased with that woman. <laughs> I mean, maybe she shouldn't have been having a fling with her interns. I don't know, but it seemed kind of fun. <laughs> I was happy to hear the rest of that story from So I said I would mention those uh, appendices, and I will very briefly, but uh, uh, as I said, if, if you're in a writer's group or you're thinking of forming one, or if you've been in, and I was interviewed for a podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, a woman who was interviewing me said, you tell these horror stories about writing workshops where people cry or people attack each other. And she said, <laughs> she said, I've never been in one of those. Does that kind of thing actually happen? I said, oh, <laughs> <laughs> you have that a charm life. <laughs> Yeah, because unfortunately, so, yeah, some quite unpleasant things have been known to happen in workshops. And uh, we, uh, we at uh, Warren Wilson, Deb, my boss is here, so it's, uh, I'm, I am so glad that I was directed that program before Deb, because I would have looked like such a complete uh, incompetent if I followed her. But anyway, uh, over the years, um, we've gotten to the point where those things rarely happen. But you're dealing with people's egos and their anxieties, of course, their concerns, and we're always looking at work that's unfinished. And so there are all kinds of reasons to be tense about it. But there are plenty of ways to diffuse that. And so in this essay about uh, writing groups or writing workshops, I try to talk about how you can approach work respectfully, but also seriously. Because a writing workshop where everybody says, boy, that's great, is not worth anybody's time. I mean, that's sweet, you know, but they're not worth anybody's time. This day, I was going to tell you two anecdotes, and then if you have any questions, we'll have them in our time, we'll be done. Uh, one anecdote is, I forgot to tell you that when I was working on Amuse and Amaze, one of the benefits I had was I got to meet Will Shorts. Uh, Will Shorts, the puzzle guy from the New York Times. I mentioned that because I met Will Shorts at the table tennis club in Phoenix, and some of my table tennis pals are here. So, uh, so it all relates, you know, all comes together. And then here, uh, you know, in the, in the, Along the lines of don't stop me if you've heard this before, you probably haven't heard this one before, but stories are like little gifts to share. And I don't get to tell this one to too many people. But when I went to the Magic Castle and you know got to try to talk to magicians and then got to see their tricks on, it was fabulous. But one of the perks is because it's a private club, you can't just buy a ticket and go into the Magic Castle. You have to be the friend of a member. Uh, and uh, so Josh, my host, had arranged for me to get in. And the woman who was kind of overseeing all this and making sure that the people upstairs and the performance parts of the castle. It's just a big house. From there. But uh, the castle uh, knew what was going on. Uh, he mentioned was going to retire after that weekend. And she had been there something like 40 or 50 years, basically her entire adult life. She had worked there. And so I went over to thank her just, you know, to try to recognize the fact that she was wasting her time with us. Uh, and, and she was on the verge of retirement. And, uh, and then I thought about it. I said, you know, 50 years. I said, you, you've seen everybody. I said, you know, who, who stands out? And she said, well, Fred Astaire was a very dear little man. <laughs> and then she said, and Cary Grant would come before he opened and sit next to me and talk. And sometimes he would open the door when I was supposed to, and you should have seen the look on the lady's face. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that stuff. <laughs> anyway, if you've got any questions about this, I'm happy to answer them. I'm also happy to let you go. <laughs> Can Shorts play? What's up? Will Shorts, can he play? Will Shorts is about, sorry, uh, is uh, like an 1850 player. And he was there with, I think, a Jamaican guy who was like a 2150 player. Uh, so he, he was pretty ferocious. But Will's a pretty yeah. Yeah, competitive player. He, he was, maybe he's finished by now, but his goal was to play, if not in every club, at least the club in every state. Yeah. And so he was in Arizona doing that. But yeah, I was impressed. Sorry. It was okay. <laughs> How do you keep track of uh, cultural references like you, you're uh, thinking of two of them, like uh, Song of Solomon and Gomer Pyle, <laughs> and know you're going to um, get your entire audience that you're writing to understand all that? Is there a, 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 a reference tool where you're going to know that anybody born between this age yeah. and this age will know? Yeah, yeah, it helps to have an audience, you know, I mean, you can kind of look and people say, who? And so, I mean, 
with my undergraduates now, I've reached the point where, you know, Monty Python doesn't connect. Uh, most movies I can refer to with any authority they've never heard of and have no interest in. And uh, all of the games that they spend most of their time with, I can't tell you anything about. So it gets harder and harder. So we build little bridges, you know, but but it's true in writing and in talking to uh, students I don't have a lot of in common with that you can offer contextual clues, you know, so I can give a thumbnail sketch of, I haven't ever tried it, a thumbnail sketch of Gomer Pyle. <laughs> and sort of clue them into what that was um, if I need to. But it is, it is, uh, it is tricky uh, to know, you know, when you're, when you're communicating to an audience that gets those references and when not. One of the challenges of these essays is to try to refer to a, a variety of work, um, you know, from a lot of very different kinds of writers, some older work, some very contemporary work, and to summarize it quickly enough that you have an idea of what it's about because probably nobody's read all these things. I'm not showing off. I mean, it's just, this is my particular library that I'm drawing from. And so I need to try to communicate what these pieces are so you don't have to read them before you read the essays. So it's a challenge. Yeah. What's, what's the most common sort of challenge that you see in the workshop of beginning libraries or even graduate? A single common challenge. You know, it's one of the most common questions. One of the one of the things that comes up the most is they'll say endings, and which is, I always have to at this point, you know, I have to breathe deeply when they say the problem is the ending because they say, you know, the problem is probably not the ending. <laughs> the problem probably occurred much earlier. <laughs> and uh, in the uh, intentionally, the last essay in this book is about uh, the openings of novels. And it's about what's prepared in the openings of novels. And I, you know, asked the rhetorical question, why would you have this last in a collection of essays? And it's because normally the beginning of a novel or story is what is, you know, gets rewritten at the end. You know, once you know where you're going, once you know what it's about, once you know the effect that you're trying to create, then you can go back and make sure you've started in the right place. Um, what's the line? E.L. Doctor said you can uh you don't need to know the ending of a novel as you read it any more than you need to see any farther than the length of your headlights if you're driving across country, right? That sounds optimistic, good, reassuring, all that. And then John Irving said, I would no, writer, no sooner start writing a novel without knowing the ending than I would start telling a joke without knowing the punchline. And that's very memorable. And, it, you know, the temptation is to say, well, that's right. Then I say, well, no, first you've got to write the joke, you know, and, and that takes some time. And then once you've got it, yes, you taught. And so the final draft of a novel should be that way. You should know where you're starting and where it goes to. So that's the question I often have to unpack the most. You know, they say, I just need to fix this last paragraph. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> probably we'll look at some other things. Yeah. So you don't write from an outline? Me? Um, you know, it's funny. I, I don't start with an outline, not for fiction or nonfiction. Uh, but at some point, especially when I'm getting bogged down, I will stop and make what I call an outline. It, it doesn't have Roman numerals or anything like that. Usually it's sentences or phrases. And especially on a bigger project, I'm working on a story that's over hundred pages right now. And I just need to keep track of how long things are and when they've happened. And so I'll make little notes so I can look at a, an outline, a skeleton of it for myself. And with an essay, often I get involved in these things and I've lost track of the argument. I don't know, you know where I am in the sequence of the discussion. And so I, I uh, will stop and sometimes I'll just pull out sentences from the actual draft. And then I look at them and say, well, that makes no sense at all. How am I gonna get from there to there? Cause I don't get it. Um, or sometimes I'll make an ideal draft, you know, that looks logical and then rearrange everything in the essay. So I use outlines, but not at the beginning. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I really recommend it. I used to read our dog. We just lost our dog the last couple months ago. And she never seemed terribly interested, I have to say. Uh, but 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 it it's um, remarkable how much of a difference. I mean, every every poet knows, and uh, it's true for fiction as well. You just hear the cadence of the language much differently. And, and sometimes you'll realize, I remember Tom Lutz, uh, our colleague and poet, uh, was once giving a reading at Warren Wilson. And he, he was reading the poem and he said something, something doily. He said, doily, not twice in one reading. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the kind of thing a writer would respond to. <laughs> it's just like, you can't haul out that specialty vocabulary twice in one night. Uh, but you do, you hear, you hear the rhythms of sentences uh, differently. I have a, 
Milan Kundera in The Art of the Novel talks about the fact that uh, he always wrote in seven sections and didn't realize it until a critic pointed it out. And then the question is, is that a problem or do I make use of it? And he decided to make use of it. Um, I realized at some point that I like lists of three. You know, he had this and that and that. That rhythm just always sounds right to me. If I write a list of two, I almost always go back and add something. And so I have to be aware that I don't fall into the trap of having every sentence with a list sound the same. So that's the kind of thing. I go, that's why I read aloud. I, I listen to those things. More those are good questions. questions. More questions. Uh, and virtual audience, you can ask some questions too. I'll give virtual answers. <laughs> yeah, I will see that virtually. Um, question about the advice you gave regarding changing the critiques that students receive of their work mm -hmm. and how it could be better. What uh, your advice was more about what, what are you looking for in this critique or, or how to structure it? How have you changed over time regarding this approach to students receiving? Critique? Yeah, so the, the old fashioned approach, old, old, old approach, which still unfortunately occurs in some places is that um, the great man or sometimes woman, uh, these were the workshops I had mostly in graduate school, will opine you know, and kind of hold forth with opinions about the work and you listen meekly and go back and respond. Um, you know, that is not great pedagogy. Uh, and, and one of the practices that started at Warren Wilson before I got there uh, was to begin those discussions or at least prepare for the discussions by uh, trying to imagine what the intention of the work is. That is not to think, I would like this story to be this thing, but to say, what is this story? Because when I teach not just undergraduates anymore, but graduates too, their stories aren't necessarily meant to be realistic. You know, they may be set in some fantastic land or they may not be, you know, true to life in some way, but they're, I'm, I mentioned this earlier today, but I'm gonna I go to Houston tomorrow and teach Flatland, uh, Edwin Abbott's 19th century book about travel through different dimensions. And the narrator is a square. Uh, it would be a big mistake to get a hold of that narrative and say, well, wait a minute, what's his wife think about this? Well, what about the kids? That's, this is not what the book is. And so you have to recognize what the poem or the story or the novel is trying to be as well as you can. And often, well, my friend Robert Boswell and I have been reading each other's work for 40 years, and we always start by kind of reiterating what we think the thing is. And it's very helpful just to hear what an intelligent reader thinks they've read. And sometimes you say, that's it. That's what, it, that's what I thought it was. And other times you say, funny, that scene's not supposed to be funny. You know, that was supposed to be heart-wrenching. And you realize you've got a problem on your hands. But if you start there, if you start by trying to recognize the intention and not that the writing is just not what you want it to be. First of all, in terms of kind of respect for the work. And also it is useful for, the, for a writer. If you're in a group, you can have five people to hear four other people say, this is what I think you were doing. And then you can kind of see how well you've communicated what you thought you were going to do. Uh, and then from there, obviously, you can offer suggestions and you can ask questions and, and uh, yeah, and, and, and it just changes the whole tone of the workshop. And more and more, one thing that's changed in my own practice is uh, one of the traditions used to be that the writer would sit quietly while, while everybody else talked about the work. And it's true, you don't get, don't get many opportunities to hear readers talk about your work. I mean, you all will buy, you know, four or five copies of this book and read it tonight. And I won't have any idea what you think of it. Um, oh, well, anyway, you know. Um, and so it just goes out into the world. And so it's a rare opportunity to have people look at a draft of a story and talk about it in front of you. And it's hard to listen. And if you start talking, it's harder to listen, uh, you know, what people are saying because you're defending it or explaining it or doing something else. But I've, once you establish the right tone in a workshop, I've never had a problem with just letting the writer ask questions or step in to provide an explanation for something or whatever. And it just, you know, it's a conversation among kind of adults all trying to help each other. We're all trying to do a difficult thing together. It works out. So that's probably the biggest change in the way I teach. So no writing workshop confidential. Uh, expose. Not for me. No. No, I've heard some great stories, but no. Well, we'd love to hear those great <laughs> stories sometime. Yeah. Uh, other uh, questions uh, from the audience? I'm curious to know how your experience at the Wonderful Single Day program as faculty and as a director has formed and inspired your own writing. 
to the yeah, so the question from Caleb was how my experience at Warren Wilson has informed my own writing. So here's a true and difficult thing to say, which is that I know to some extent it's probably suppressed some of my writing because you're surrounded by people doing great work and it gets harder and harder to, uh, you know, create and offer to people early drafts of work that I think just aren't there because you're, you know, consistently surrounded by really good writers all the time. Uh, you know, when I was younger in writing, I mean, I wrote all the time. I was just uh, ridiculously prolific. I'm not saying it was any good, but I wrote without any kind of, uh, uh, you know, any kind of break, any kind of muffler on what I was doing. I just put everything on paper and uh, I don't do that uh, anymore. Now it's a much slower process. Um, but it certainly helped in the same way that it's helped my teaching, I think, just to hear so many different possibilities. It's been pretty liberating. I mean, I know this isn't fiction, it's maps the imagination, but, but and that book is more mine than anything I've written, I think, because it's just a grab bag of my toys. You know, the Marx Brothers are in there, the Looney Tunes are in there, stories about my mother's uh, hairdresser are in there, just all kinds of things, including a lot of books that I love. And then all the pictures that I put in there, that's just, it's just peach dream of a book. <laughs> and uh, luckily it communicated with a lot of other people. And that encouraged me too, to think that whatever I wanted to write would find a place, you know, would find an audience. Steve Orland, uh, who taught with this for a long time, and who was my teacher back at University of Arizona, a part of the job as director, which Deb uh, does so beautifully and I did kind of strangely, um, is to give all these public talks. You have to give an opening day talk, you have to give a closing talk, you have to give other talks. And uh, I just couldn't do it entirely with a straight face. So I would tell stories all the time and sometimes they got a little weird. Um, and they were often uh, purposeful digressions, which is something I write about here. Uh, you know, I would, I would seem to be so far removed from what we were actually supposed to talk about that people would be worried. And there's of course a pleasure in that if I could make it work. And uh, Steve Orland, the poet, said, have you ever tried to write a story like that? And to that point, I had not. I had, I had kept that for public speaking. And, uh, and after uh, Steve told me that and I started writing a completely different kind of sentence, uh, Steve said that was advice he had gotten, you know, that kind of liberated him from short lyric poems to the longer poems that he started to write. And so uh, I think being surrounded by so many different writers who are doing work so differently can also be liberating. You say there is no right story. You know, there is no best thing. It's just that great thing, this great thing, and another. What are you working on next in maybe another book? Maybe you mentioned that. Yeah, I've got this uh, collection of related stories. Will it be a novel? They won't tell me. Um, but right now I've got a uh, hundred pages. Eight people are somewhere in the Grand Canyon. Unfortunately, they seem perfectly happy. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has fallen, no broken bones. Somebody's got to suffer. Uh, so I'm trying to see. Uh, actually, they, they all, the story right now is I got a tentative title of uh, Into the Great Unknown. And I, I sort of had the Canterbury Tales in mind. I was putting these eight people on a trip, all facing life changes and uh, trying to figure out, you know, what might happen to them on the basis of this trip. But it's taking them a long time. <laughs> That's true. It's a big canyon. Thanks. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, we appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing your insights and your good humor and uh, a wealth of experience of trying to help make so many people better writers and more confident. So thank you, audience, also live and virtual for being here this evening.